Welcome folks to this year's Paleo Rewind. If you're new to this, this is a series of videos organized by the channel Edge Science where we science communicators work together to bring you all of the major and sometimes minor paleontology discoveries over the last year, and I'm very happy to be a part of it. Today we're going to be looking at January 2024, which, if you weren't aware, was jam-packed with studies and new discoveries including Tyrannosaurus, Megalodon, and so much more. So let's dive right in, starting us off with some of the creatures and life that was discovered over the course of January. Not exactly a creature, but starting us off is the discovery of ancient cyanobacteria that's nearly 2 billion years old. The discovery of these absolutely ancient fossils is really cool because they contain something known as thylakoid membranes. You see, these membranes are found in what is known as chloroplasts, and they play a direct role in photosynthesis. This is now the earliest known example of photosynthesis, extending it back in time around 1.2 billion years. This is a significant discovery because it shows us that the rich oxygen atmosphere that sustains life on our planet was starting almost twice as early as we thought. Of course, there's long been speculation that this was the case, but this is the first definitive proof and it's absolutely wonderful. Moving on, one of the most interesting creatures discovered in January was an ancient worm-like creature from the Cambrian known as Tamora Bestia. These fossils were found in Greenland at the Sirius Pisset fossil formation and date back to around 520 million years ago. And I misspoke earlier, they're not just related to worms, but they technically are directly related to a modern day group of animals, and forgive me for mispronouncing this, known as Chaetognaths or arrowworms, which are small predatory worms that live in the ocean and feed on zooplankton. These prehistoric arrowworms are quite a bit larger than their modern counterparts, reaching around 20 centimeters or 7 inches in length. For the Cambrian, this would have made them relatively large predators alongside the arthropods that were emerging at this time. These worms had fins on either side that resembled a primitive version of stingray fins and two long antennae as well as a primitive rounded tail fin. And honestly, this just goes to show us how complex life was, even in its early stages. A new Aetosaur, a crocodile relative from the Triassic that resembles ankylosaurs, was also discovered this year. Dubbed Garza Pelta, it hailed from around 218 million years ago in the late Triassic and was found in the Cooper Canyon Formation in Texas. The fossils were actually discovered a long time ago, all the way back in 1989, but after they were first proposed as a new genus, debates began. It was argued for a long time, but it wasn't until this January that it was officially recognized and named. They were fairly large animals, reaching around 11 to 12 feet, around 3.5 meters, and they had fairly unique armor as well. In fact, their armor is so unique that they may represent their own group within the Aetosaurs, but that's still up for debate itself. There was also another crocodile relative discovered, and this one was much more closely related to modern-day crocs known as Varanosuchus. That name may sound familiar because it's actually based on the binomial name of a modern group of lizards, Varanus, aka the monitor lizards, like Komodo dragons. Varanosuchus was named such because it closely resembled the varanid lizards, with a less flattened and deeper skull than most other crocodiles. These guys are part of a group of animals known as Atoposaurids, which evolved just outside of the main line of Eusuchia, which led to modern-day crocodiles. These guys actually helped in determining the placement of Atoposaurids as a whole, showing us that they were the sister group to the Paraalligatoridae. It has adaptations for both an aquatic and terrestrial lifestyle, which had long been speculated for Atoposaurids, but we never had a clear idea. These guys are around 130 to 135 million years old and come from the Sawakua Formation in Thailand. I wasn't able to find any official size estimates for them, but I have a feeling they weren't particularly large, but hopefully a more clear picture of their size is painted in the future. Reptiles and worms weren't the only discoveries this year, as a new amphibian, also from the Triassic like the Aetosaur, was discovered as well. This particular animal was a Temnospondyl, a group of large amphibians that developed adaptations that allowed them to leave the water more frequently and for longer periods. This new animal is Kowadisuchus, from the early Triassic around 249 million years ago in the Sango do Cabral Formation in Brazil. They were giants by the standards of modern-day amphibians, reaching around 5 feet or 1.5 meters long. Interestingly, this particular animal is part of a group known as Benthosuchidae, which previously was only found in Russia and places nearby. This is the first discovered in ancient Gondwana and extends their range significantly, which is fantastic. A new cat was also discovered, dubbed Majerophilus, from a place known as Principe Pio II in Madrid, Spain. It hails from around 15 million years ago, when Europe was a much more wild place. Now, they're not as giant as big cats that everyone loves, but they're more around the size of a lynx or a caracal. While no length estimates were given, a weight of around 7.5 kilograms, about 17 pounds, was. That makes them a little bit smaller than a lynx, but you get the picture, these weren't your average house cats. They found the jaw of these animals in exceptional preservation, showing us that these guys had a much more robust and powerful set of jaws than any modern counterpart. 
They estimated that these guys would be able to take on larger prey than you'd expect, including the large lagomorphs, aka rabbits and hares, that it lived alongside. That being said, this limited information was based off a single specimen, but ever since its discovery, more have been reassigned to Majerophilus, which makes me hopeful for more news in the future. If I had a nickel for every sauropod discovered in January, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. The first of these is a Robachi sword from the Huancul Formation of Argentina around 95 million years ago, dubbed Cidersora. Now, Argentina is no stranger to Robachi swords, and in fact, this guy would have shared territory with other Robachi swords like Lime Saurus. But Cidersora is different in its size. Where most Robachi swords are relatively small when compared to other sauropods, these guys were actually still fairly large. These guys are currently estimated to reach 59 to 66 feet, about 18 to 20 meters, and weigh up to 15 tons, making them true tanks. It took several years to fully uncover this behemoth, and in fact, so much time and land was excavated to fully uncover it that they also discovered the holotype of the Carcharodontosaur known as Meraxes. The other sauropod discovered in January is a titanosaur from the late Cretaceous of China around 90 million years ago in the Zhaoshan Formation. This animal was named Gandhi Titan, meaning Earth Titan. Titanosaurs come in all shapes and sizes, and even though I wasn't able to find a weight estimate, I was able to find a length estimate for these guys at around 46 feet or 14 meters in length. One thing about titanosaurs is that when determining their weight, there's a lot of factors, because just estimating from related animals could give us a wild estimate anywhere from 5 to 20 tons or more. These guys were relatively basal and primitive titanosaurs, so they probably weren't exceptionally large. Though their age suggests that they may be part of a group of titanosaurs that we're just not fully aware of yet in Asia, so hopefully it leads to some more new discoveries. Staying in Asia, we also have material from two new stegosaurids, and cue the Doofenshmirtz quote again. I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. Except one of these animals wasn't named, and there's a good reason for that, but let's talk about the one who was first. This animal is called Yanbei Long, and it's from the Zhuo Yun Formation in China, and it dates to around 110 to 113 million years ago, making it one of the youngest stegosaurids ever known. This animal is related to both Stegosaurus from North America and Werhosaurus from Asia, and this is important because it's long been thought that North America and Asia were connected at some point during the Cretaceous. Now we think it may have been connected even earlier, or it happened multiple times. Whatever the case, these animals managed to hold on in the early Cretaceous when they were going extinct almost everywhere else. No official size estimates have been made for these guys because their fossil material is incredibly fragmentary, which does lead us to the second stegosaur, which also happens to be incredibly fragmentary. It's thought that this one, however, may be a species of stegosaurus itself, but was also found in Asia. Now, this isn't confirmed in any official capacity, and more studies would need to be done to do so, but if this is true, that means there was a species of stegosaurus belonging to the same genus as the ones from North America existing in Asia in the early Cretaceous. Which leads us back to that connection between North America and Asia, and like I said, we aren't entirely sure, but hopefully new studies can come out on these fossils to help us better understand. Another new dinosaur, a Canignathid oviraptorid, or a hell chicken if you will, was also discovered in January. This creature was dubbed Eoneofron, named after the modern-day Neofron, aka the Egyptian vulture. These guys are estimated at around 66 to 68 million years old, from the late Cretaceous of North America in the Hell Creek Formation, alongside one of the most famous assortments of dinosaurs in history. Previously, the only Canignathid oviraptorid here was Anzu, a more famous relative of this new dinosaur. While no official length or height estimates were given, it was estimated to be around 3 feet tall at the hip, meaning it would probably be a little bit shorter than the human, and a weight estimate was given, estimating around 170 pounds or 77 kilograms. These guys were actually thought to be a juvenile of Anzu when they were first discovered, but a new study showed that it was actually around 6 years old and already skeletally mature. In my opinion, that makes it a welcome addition to the Hell Creek. But, undoubtedly, one of the most talked about discoveries of this January was a new species of the tyrant lizard itself, Tyrannosaurus. Instead of a rex, this is Tyrannosaurus macraensis. The fossils of these guys were discovered all the way back in 1983, but they weren't named until this year. It was proposed as a new species in the 90s, but this never took on weight and it was heavily disputed, making it go into obscurity in the public eye. In 2015, it was argued that the fossils of this specimen didn't have all the traits of a rex, so it was tentatively assigned to Tyrannosaurus sp. And thus, in January of this year, a new study was published identifying it as a new species entirely, the first one to stick in quite some time in the long history of Tyrannosaurus. 
Dubbed Macrayensis after the McRae Group, a series of rocks in the Hall Lake formation where it was found, these guys are much older than their famous relatives, around 71 to 73 million years. They weren't much smaller though, with current estimates placing them around 39 feet or 12 meters in length and weighing in at around 7 to 8 tons. It has multiple differences from a rex, including a less prominent chin and a shallower jaw, meaning its bite probably wasn't as powerful, but still plenty powerful enough, don't get me wrong. Aside from being a new tyrannosaur, this find is amazing for multiple reasons. First, it kind of confirms that large-body tyrannosaurs were driven to such extreme sizes by the rapid growth of their prey, which had also grown to enormous proportions during the Cretaceous. It also shows us that these guys could have possibly originated from the southern half of Laramidia, the island continent that was half of the United States where these guys originate from and later T-Rex would emerge. And lastly, it shows us that the evolution of Tyrannosaurus and just life in general is more complicated than we thought. It's probably one of the most brilliant finds of the year, and it's absolutely amazing. But that wasn't the only Tyrannosaur news for January. An age-old debate was once again reignited with a paper that claimed Nanotyrannus is a separate genus from Tyrannosaurus rex. This is a topic with an incredibly long history, bouncing back and forth with the question, is Nanotyrannus valid? We had thought it was settled until now. The study used several factors to back their claim, including that the growth rings were packed to the edge of the bones in this particular specimen, which they suggested meant it was nearing adulthood. However, they were quickly rebuffed by other paleontologists, though I think it is important to note that no conclusive answer has been given as of yet. Personally, I think Thomas Holtz, the world's leading expert on Tyrannosaurs, said it best. It's worth noting that Holtz is very open about either possibility, as long as the proof is good enough. But he believes that this paper is inconclusive. He points out that the morphological differences, as demonstrated by other paleontologists like Thomas Carr, can be attributed to individual variation and can be seen across other Tyrannosaur species between their older and younger selves. Holtz believes that this study will serve as a catalyst for future debates, and that while it certainly reignites said debates, it doesn't provide conclusive evidence for either. Personally, I agree. While I'd love for Nanotyrannus to be valid, there just isn't enough evidence to separate it from a T-Rex as of right now. However, there isn't enough data to definitively call it a juvenile rex either, though there is more data leaning this way. However, as Holt said, a new specimen that is definitively either an adult Nanotyrannus or definitively a juvenile T-Rex is really the only way to settle this debate. He also mentions that other undescribed specimens like the dueling dinosaurs could potentially shed even more light into this debate. It was a pretty good start to this year's arguments. But dinosaurs weren't the only ones with research. A new study was also published about the extinction of the largest primate to ever live that we know of, Gigantopithecus. If you're unfamiliar, these large primates are thought to be close relatives of orangutans, albeit much larger and less nimble. Previously, they were thought to have survived until the late Pleistocene, but this new study contested that idea. You see, these giants were forest specialists, surviving on fruit and fibrous plants in their ecosystem. However, around 700,000 years ago, the forests they call home began to experience more dramatic seasonal change as the weather got far more intense. Monsoons and similar weather patterns changed the landscape, forcing them to seek new sources of food. Grasslands began to emerge, driving the forests back and reducing these animals' range. Cold weather on top of the intense rain from the monsoons was also thought to play a factor. Where the orangutan could adapt, Gigantopithecus could not despite its attempts. It was just far too specialized of an animal, which led to its downfall. This is actually something seen fairly common in paleontology, where an animal that is far too specialized ends up dying off earlier than you'd expect because they simply cannot cope with the changes in their environment. This new study suggests that they went extinct around 215 to 295,000 years ago, much earlier than we initially thought. Unfortunately, their relatives left them behind because they could not adapt fast enough. A tragedy to be sure, but one that we may finally know the conclusion to. That was kind of sad, so in happier mammal news, a study was published that focused on the movements over the lifetime of a particular woolly mammoth. My apologies if I'm butchering this name, but the mammoth was called Elma Eugea. Her remains are around 14,000 years old, and she was estimated to be about 20 when she died. The study did isotopic and genetic analysis on her and several other mammoths in nearby localities, hoping to find related animals in a sort of mammoth family tree. Which, it seems they were successful and were able to find related animals, but some folks may ask how. You see, mammoth tusks grow like trees, with thin layers building over one another over time. This can tell us not only the growth, but by studying the isotopic materials that collected in each layer of the tusk, we can learn where this mammoth was moving over time. 
Their analysis showed that Elma originated in what is modern-day Yukon, Canada, before traveling over 600 miles to Alaska, where she would live out the rest of her days. She was found in a locality that also preserved the remains of two younger animals, which were shown to be closely related to her. Personally, I always really love studies like this, because they really give us a peek and insight into what the lifestyle and daily actions of these animals were. This was probably one of my personal favorite papers, an absolutely wonderful study. The last major event in paleontology that I'd like to talk about in January is what happened to the Meg, or Otodus Megalodon, the most famous extinct shark in history. Megalodon are famous for being depicted as essentially gigantic versions of the modern-day great white shark. As such, much of our estimations on its size and build have been based on that over the years. Previous estimates for the Meg had them at about 47 to 67 feet, about 14 to 20 meters in length with an overall chunky body plan similar to a great white. However, this new study throws that completely out the window. Of course, a concrete size or shape has never really been known since we only have jaws, teeth, and vertebrae to work with, but a great deal of information can still be found, as it was here. The team on the study found that the vertebrae were thinner when compared to the jaws and would make the animals slimmer and longer in tandem. Instead of the gray-white, they'd suggested using a mako shark as a better representation. No size estimate was given, and that's probably for the best, because without a full skeletal, we probably just won't know for sure. Regardless, this study will undoubtedly change the way we approach the research of this extinct giant and could lead to some interesting new studies down the line. If you'd like, Benji Thomas has a great video specifically about this Meg topic, so I definitely go check that out if you can. And with that, folks, we've discussed the major research and discoveries made in paleontology in January 2024. Thanks once again to Edge Science for having us join in on this year's Paleo Rewind. Make sure to tune in for the next parts featuring some other amazing Paleo creators. I hope you enjoyed, folks, and I look forward to learning more about the past with you next year in 2025. Thank you all so very much for joining me, and until next time, remember to be good people, drink plenty of water, and have a fantastic day.